Hi, this is Steve at blessedhopeforever.com. We're in our survey in Acts. We're uh, in the chapter 3. Survey of the book of Acts, chapter 3, uh, verse 18 is where we left off. Uh, let's begin with a word of prayer. Our Father and our God, we stand again in Thy presence by means of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit thankful for the privilege and the opportunity to gather together and to worship you, to open your precious word, to think about it, to meditate on it, to feast upon it. May the Holy Spirit take control of this message that we might learn of you, that your word might be more precious to us, and that our attention and our affection might be directed heavenward, I ask this in Christ's name I pray. Amen. In this Bible survey uh, series, we're in the book of Acts. We're in chapter 3. And we stopped at the end of the paragraph at uh, verse 18. Verse 18. You'll remember that, that here there is a certain man, a man singled out by God, uh, who's been outside the temple for at least 40 years as a beggar. He's been lame, and Peter and John coming to the temple have been used by the Spirit of God to heal him. And now Peter has taken the opportunity to preach to the congregation that had assembled there in the outer court of the temple. And we stopped midway uh, in his sermon he begins the paragraph then at verse 19, change your mind, repent, therefore. Change your mind and be converted. And I suggest to you that the word converted does not mean what our normal idea of conversion is, that they become new creations in Christ Jesus. But rather it is a change of mind concerning the Word of God. A change of mind concerning the person of Jesus Christ that your sins may be blotted out. Obliterated is the word. Uh, but I believe that the context shows this is in the area of fellowship and communion. He came unto His own, His own received Him not. And that's when the refreshing, uh, times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord, and He shall send Jesus Christ, which before was preached unto you. Now that is a strong statement to the Jews to declare to them that Christ had been preached unto them before. First of all, uh, we could say that uh, that is previous preaching by the apostles. I believe it is saying that the Old Testament Scriptures preached of Jesus Christ, who of course was the promised Messiah, uh, whom heaven must receive until the times of restitution of all things. Uh, there's arguments that exist as to whether or not that is the establishment of the kingdom or at the end of the kingdom, uh, the new heavens and the new earth. I'm going to suggest that, I'm, well, I'm, I'm going to tell you that what I believe, and that is I believe that that looks forward to the new heaven and the new earth. These things are spoken of by the prophets. One of those prophets was Moses, and he spoke of Jesus Christ. Who do you think he meant? Says Peter to these Jews. When you know he spoke of a prophet who God should raise up like unto Moses. That's one that they would listen to. Not only is that prophetic scripture, but that is the pronouncement of the sovereign God that Israel will listen to Christ and it shall come to pass that every soul who will not hear that prophet shall be destroyed from among the people. This is how our text reads. And not only did Moses say this, but all of the prophets from, from Samuel and uh, onward, basically, those who, who followed after, every prophet who has spoken has foretold of these days. Now you are the sons of the prophet 
Peter's saying, and you are the sons of the covenant which God made with Abraham. And dearly beloved, I want you to note, wherever the covenant is mentioned in the Scriptures, it is God who covenanted. It is not Abraham who covenanted with God. It's uh, not David who covenanted with God. It's God who covenanted with Abraham. And it's God who covenant, covenanted with David. And, and in thy seed, in thy seed, verse 25, it's, it's singular. You know, I would argue strongly that the seed there is not the children of Israel, but is in fact the Lord Jesus Christ. In Galatians, I believe that uh, the third chapter he saith not seeds as of many, but as of one unto thy seed, which is Christ. And I believe that the singular is just as significant here. You know, never ceases to amaze me. The Lord Jesus Christ taught supreme theology on the tense of a verb. He did not say, I was the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, but he said, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And on the present tense of that verb, the Lord Jesus Christ taught eternal life and He taught resurrection from the dead. On the singular or the plural of a noun rests tremendous theology. It's no wonder God declares that not one jot or little or tittle of His Word shall pass away. And in thy seed shall all kindreds of the earth be blessed. Not only Israel, not only the sons of the prophet, not only the sons of the covenant, but all kindreds of the earth shall be blessed in the Lord Jesus Christ. If you remember back in uh, Romans, uh, I believe chapter 2, where the Scriptures say that to the Jew first and then to the Gentile, I'm, I'm going to say that that does not speak of importance, but of chronology. The Gospel was was in fact first in, in point of time preached to the Jew and then in point of time preached to the Gentiles. If one takes the seed to mean the nation Israel, then one can argue, even as some Israelites do today, that it's God's purpose to, to convert the nations by Israelites, not by Christ. And there are all kinds of warped ideas that can be drawn from taking the seed there as the nation Israel rather than the Lord Jesus Christ. Galatians says it is Christ. One seed, Christ. Going on then in verse 26. Unto you first God, having raised up His Son Jesus, sent Him to bless you in turning away every one of you from His iniquities. Now I believe that the you there speaks of the house of Israel that belongs to God and whether or not they turn uh, from their tenacious hold on the law. The Holy Spirit is clearly indicating that God has turned them from their iniquities by the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Please take note of that. Read the verse. The word first in verse 26 is once again not uh, one of importance, but rather one of chronology, one of time, first in time. Beginning then in the fourth chapter, in the fourth chapter, you'll recognize that in Peter's sermon, which grew out of the healing of this lame man, here's a man, a designated man who's been born lame from birth, at least from birth, and now he's healed. You know, and I reckon that I could use that as a springboard, you know, for any number of sermons. But principally, the Holy Spirit used that as a springboard for the resurrection of, of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And the resurrection of Jesus Christ is the very warp and woo of the Gospel. If, if Christ be not risen, then you and I are of all men most to be pitied. And every epistle, every epistle, makes claims of its authority in the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
Well, that was a bad thing to preach at this particular moment in history because the high priest was the Sadducee and the Sadducees were those who did not believe at all in souls, uh, spirits, demons. Their interest was in the all-important things of this life, not the resurrection from the dead. No return, no eschatology, and that included the high priest at this particular time. So the priests and the captain of the temple, the temple guard, guards, the Sadducees, came upon them being grieved that they taught the people and preached by means of Jesus the resurrection from the dead. Little wonder. The Sadducees are willing to call him Jesus, but surely not Lord, Lord or, or Christ. Peter has definitely connected the Jesus of Nazareth with the Jehovah of the Old Testament. Of course, in doing that, he's, he's preached the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And of course, that would destroy the very framework of what the Sadducees taught. And here they're teaching it in the temple. In the temple. So the text says they laid hands on them. So they took them into custody. You know, they had the authority to do that. Uh, you needed authority in the temple. There were any number of Gentiles or, or I suppose some Jews, you know, who would try to force their way into that area, which was considered to be very sacred. And so they had their temple guard. These men were arrested. It was in the afternoon. It's, it says it was now evening. Uh, evening to the Jew was 3 o'clock in the afternoon until 6 o'clock. Night, night, uh, night was 6 o'clock. was from 6 o'clock, I guess it was, it was sometime after 3 in the afternoon. Too late for the Sanhedrin to meet. In fact, their law forbid a meeting at night. That is, after 6 o'clock. However, they did that in the case of the Lord Jesus Christ. As far as we know, the only time in recorded history that the Sanhedrin ever met as a, an official body to try a case, our Lord Jesus Christ. And here, they would not meet in the evening. So these men had to spend the entire night in custody. However, as a result of Peter's little sermon here, there were about 5,000 who believed. 5,000. 5,000, dearly beloved. Okay? You could never convince me that that was the result of Peter's oratory skills or his charisma or anything else. Surely that is the work of the Holy Spirit. And it came to pass the text says the next day that the rulers, the scribes, uh, Annas, the high priest, uh, and Caiaphas, and John, and Alexander, and as many, well, as were of the, the kindred of the high priest, were gathered together at Jerusalem. And when they had set them in their midst, they asked, by what power or by what name are you doing this? You're now told in verse 8 that Peter was filled with the Holy Spirit. Filled with the Holy Spirit. We have a command in Ephesians, if you remember back when this was one of the earliest books we studied through, be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. And there are all kinds of warped ideas that have grown out of being filled with the Holy Spirit. Well, I know what that means. You know, filled. Like it's as if taking some kind of a container into which you can pour uh, more and more of a something uh, until it's overflowing. It runs over. But that is not the concept of the word feel. Okay? It's used that way in Ephesians where the Holy Spirit is saying, if you drink wine to excess, drunkenness, you'll then be controlled by the wine. It'll control how you walk. It'll control how you talk. It'll control how you think rather than being controlled by 
wine be controlled by the Holy Spirit, who will then control how you think, how you walk, how you talk, and, and that's pretty much it in a nutshell. Now here we have the Holy Spirit declare that Peter was controlled by the Holy Spirit. You'll see the same word in verse 31. And when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together. And they were all, they were moved. The place was moved. They were moved in their hearts. They were moved. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. And they spake the Word of God with boldness. And once again, we are speaking of the control of the Holy Spirit. And the Scriptures seem to tell us what holiness is. Surely it is not rolling on the floor speaking in tongues or being you know, on cloud nine, but rather speaking truth. Every man with his neighbor. Letting not the sun go down on your wrath which are likely to have. Here we find that Peter is now controlled with the Holy Spirit, and you would think every one of us would want to eagerly look at this passage of Scripture so that we can see what it is, to see just what kind of enthusiasm pervaded Peter's being or, or whatever. And what do we see? He spoke to them the Word of God. He starts out, you know, you rulers of the people and, and others of Israel, he recognizes who they are. He, he's, a, he's courteously addressing them by the right of their office. So under the control of the Holy Spirit, not the logic of Peter, we are looking at a case where clearly we now know what it means to be filled with the Spirit. We know that we're commanded to be filled with the Spirit and here we have a clear illustration that being filled with the Spirit turned the point of the conversation to the Lord Jesus Christ. If we this day be examined of the good deed done to the, to the lame guy here, by what means is he made whole? Be it known unto you all and to all the people of Israel, that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, even by Him doth this man stand here before you whole. Be it known unto you. Well, it would seem to, to me that the most popular thing to express today would be the man's faith. The lame guy's faith, or even Peter's faith. What, what I really want to tell you guys is this man had faith to be made whole, and if you'd just have faith, well, the same thing would happen to you. Now, you can't miss on a message like that, folks, because for, for all of those for whom it doesn't work, well, you've got the, now you've got the perfect out. Well, they just didn't have enough faith. If you could have faith like that, man, I mean, you could move mountains. And that's, that's Scripture. I understand that's Scripture. And, but somehow or other, we take from the Scriptures what supports our beliefs, but we, we, we seem to care very, very little about context or meaning or purpose in what was said. Dearly beloved, it was not the lame man's faith. John and Peter did, did not stop and say, well, you know, you have enough faith to be made whole. You really, you really had, if you really had faith, you could get up. Okay, you know, the, the word faith never comes into this picture at all. Please note that. Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have, give unto, unto thee, rise, take up thy bed and walk. Where's, where's the requirement for faith? Wow, Peter, I mean, what a chance you took. I mean, you know, what if the guy didn't rise up and take, rise, take up his bed and walk? Well, you'd look like a fool. Well, since I don't want to look like a fool, I'm going to make it dependent on your faith. And then if you don't get up, boy, then now it's your, your problem. 
You're, you're the problem. Not, not me. And we call that preaching the Word. Now here is a man that we can see filled with the Holy Spirit and all he does is courteously, courteously speak to those who accused him and immediately turn the conversation to Jesus Christ. Now that's interesting when one looks at the context. Because the Lord said that I'm going to leave you and when I leave you, I'm going to send the Comforter, another one just, just like myself, a Comforter who will not speak of himself, but he'll speak of me. Now that's very significant. If I'm to look at any topic in the Word of God, of being controlled or filled by the Holy Spirit, it must come back to speaking of the Lord Jesus Christ. And there's an awful lot of, of speaking of the Spirit today as though the Spirit is testifying of the Spirit. But folks, the Scriptures declare that the true Holy Spirit, the one and only Holy Spirit, will testify of Christ. And within one sentence, within one sentence, Peter is away from the man, away from human responsibility, away from human pride, away from the results of human faith, away from acceptance or repentance or baptism or anything you want to name. In one sentence, he's away from all of that to the person and the work of Jesus Christ. Be it known unto you, and not only, not only to you, rulers, but to all the people of Israel, that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, not only the rulers, but the masses, whom God raised from the dead. Now that's not very tactful, because he's principally speaking to a group of rulers and leaders whose who believes that there is no resurrection from the dead. Surely they would have enjoyed, preferred to discuss the miracle. That's their question. They ask, by what power or by what authority have you done this? And I'm, I'm certain that they anticipated a, a lengthy discussion on the, the miracle. But within one sentence, one sentence, they're centered in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Back in, in Romans, I remember in Romans, I'm, I'm told that, that he's, he's declared to be the Son of God by a resurrection from the dead. And going through every epistle, I find that I'm introduced to the resurrection of Jesus Christ until finally I reach the book of Peter, First and Second Peter, where I'm told that He's begotten me again by a living hope by the resurrection from the dead. The payment of my sin took the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. Had He not risen from the dead, we would have no living hope. Now the Holy Spirit's control has directed the conversation not to man, but to Christ and what He did, not what man must do, but on what Christ did and His resurrection from the dead whom God raised from the dead, even, even by Him. This man does not, not stand here before you by his faith or his acceptance, not even by his change of mind, but by Jesus Christ, whom God raised from the dead. That control of the Holy Spirit turns me to this book. It turns me to the Word of God. Verse 11. A quote from the Psalms. Uh, he's the stone which the builders rejected, you know, the, uh, which become the head stone, the head corner. This is the stone that has become the head of the corner. This is the cornerstone. It must be the central theme of the Spirit's control. So, so not only does control of the Holy Spirit direct me to the Lord Jesus Christ in His work, but to the Word of God. Neither is there deliverance in any other. You know, you have to look at the setting. I mean, what he's saying is absolutely true 
but he's saying it to people who are preaching a totally different concept. Neither is there deliverance in any other. For there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. The must there is the must of necessity, not the must of obligation. It's the same must where we must appear before the judgment seat of Christ. You don't have a choice in that. It's the application of the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, if I look at the control of the Holy Spirit, if I'm correct in, in setting it in this context, I have what? One, two, three, four, five verses, I think. I only have uh, two or three sentences, yet what a tremendous sermon. It would seem then that the control of the Holy Spirit is not necessarily verbiage, skilled oratory, not, not that I would suggest that there's anything wrong with that, that there's no skill there. I want to be very careful in what I'm saying, but there is a tremendous tendency uh, to, you know, in some circles at least, you know, to couple the control of the Holy Spirit with intelligence and education and, and talent and so forth. I am not running down or, or downplaying education at all, okay? Some years ago, I had a guy call me, you know, saying, you know, would I mind if he asked me some questions? And I said, well, I, you know, I, I doubt that he'd get, get very good answers, but, but he could ask anyway. And he asked some questions, and, and I won't rehearse those, but, but, I finally, uh, but finally he said, well, where did you go to school? And I told him. I, I didn't really know what else to say. Uh, he was trying to, to probe into my theology by finding out where I was educated. And he said, oh, well, I suppose that's all right. But, but personally, I place a good deal of emphasis on Dallas Bible College, or, or I think he said Bible, da uh, Bible da Dallas Theological Seminary. Bless his heart. He obviously sets his goals high. But I guess I turned him off by telling him I, I didn't come out of Dallas. What I'm suggesting to you folks is that the control of the Holy Spirit does not necessarily mean a PhD or being skilled in, in speaking or uh, what we from a, a human standpoint might call uh, profound logic or wisdom, human wisdom or, or anything else, but rather a very straightforward presentation of the truth of this book. We may want the praise or the glory, but it seems to me that the supremely important consideration is the truth of God's Word. I believe when one dares to presume to be a child of God, he must exercise supreme care in the handling of this book. It's not man's logic, nor his scholarship, nor his opinion or anything else that matters but what this book says. And if one dares to presume to be a man of God, then our direction must be in the Word of God. Peter did not proclaim that which would make him popular, but that which is true. Verse 13, and we only have a, a few sentences from Peter, but they were very, very significant to these rulers. I don't want you to lose sight of the fact, neither do I want to slow down too much in our survey, but I don't want you to lose sight of the fact that those whom the Scriptures are calling the rulers and the priests were highly educated people. And once again, I'm, I am not opposed to education. You know, I went to school for nine years because I had trouble getting out of the freshman class. No surprise, I had to stay back in kindergarten a few years. But I am a strong propon proponent of education. I, b I believe in it. I believe that you should get all of the education that you can. I am not coming up with any uh, thesis against the advancement from the standpoint of scholarship. But I do want you to see that the Holy Spirit is making it clear that 
that you are not incapacitated if you if you do not or or are or are not the product of modern scholarship the fact of the matter is the situation here presented to us which the holy spirit doesn't really uh, bother to enlighten or to elaborate on is one that's almost ludicrous or, or peter's uh, education was surely minimal i believe that he he could not have been held any more in lower regard by these rulers but they saw the boldness of peter and john and they perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men do you suppose that they did that by willing uh, to well you know I don't know. Do you think these rulers wrote to all the, the high schools and universities and you know to see what their pedigree was? I mean, seriously? I don't know what they did. I'll simply state to you as we go through the survey that I see in verse 13 that it was obvious that Peter was un, uneducated from the world's standpoint. Now, I could be totally wrong about that, you know. You know, and you have every right to study the scriptures in your own way. You know, it could be that they, they checked the local high school, the local college, they wrote the, the letters of, of, they wrote for letters of reference and they really investigated Peter. I tend to doubt that. That could be, but I doubt that occurred. I'm suggesting to you that I think that's highly unlikely. You have to bear in mind that the, the tool being used by the Holy Spirit is Luke. First of all, he's a Gentile. You know, I'm not reading Luke's logic, but the Word of God. What I'm asking you to realize is that a highly educated man is writing about highly educated men, his own peers, talking to two men who are obviously unlearned and ignorant. You know, here's, here's likely some engine. There's probably some engineer someplace who can't mathematically write the equations, but he's got his finger on the problem. And, and now I'm, I have to side with this humble, ignorant operator who has no education. But I'm certain that he has his finger on the problem. It seems to me from a, a human standpoint that there would be a great tendency on the part of Luke to side with those of, of scholarship. Note that he doesn't do that. You know, rather than siding with those who are, uh, I, I don't know, you know, these unlearned and un ignorant fishermen. Or, well, you know. Now I may have drawn, may have drawn totally the wrong conclusions from this. I've admitted to you folks how I study scripture. I look at each verse. I try to put myself there. I try to see what God is saying. Verse 13, now, now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, they marveled and they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus and beholding the man which was healed standing with them. They could say nothing against him. They perceived the word perceptions there in the text they perceived and i, I assume that uh, the language is indicating that it, it was obvious by simple perception not by deep investigation that they were unlearned and ignorant men and those who were learned supposed to be learned marveled now there there had to be a reason for this the word for marvel there is so strong that there's the indication that an educated man would search for a reason. And the reason is stated. They took knowledge. And I think that's beautiful. They took knowledge that they had been with Jesus. I've suggested uh, to you folks on a number of occasions that, that when the apostles speak of the Lord, they call Him the Lord Jesus Christ. I believe every time in the Word of God or that you see the name Jesus alone, it is significant. 
I believe the Holy Spirit is indicating here that these men had before them not only the miracle of a lame man made whole, a pronouncement of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, uh, an empty tomb to back it up, you know, because it's only 50 days ago, but they had the miracle of these unlearned and ignorant men speaking not only boldly, Okay, now that doesn't mean arrogantly, but with scholarship, as far as the scriptures are concerned, and they, they tacitly admit that the reason for them marveling is not the miracle, but Jesus. Not the Lord Jesus Christ, but Jesus. Then they looked at the man who was healed, okay, standing with them, and they could say nothing against it. Here are educated men in the presence of uneducated men who are speechless. You know, I, th I think immediately of the scripture that says that in that day every mouth shall be stopped. I think the human mind, you know, that is the antagonistic human mind, you know, feels that uh, they're eager for the time when they can present their case before God. My Bible tells me that when that time comes, every mouth is going to be stopped. It's going to be immediately obvious, their speech, so, you know, they couldn't do anything in front of the crowd. They ordered that these fellows go aside and then they conferred among themselves. What are we going to do? You know, we have to admit that an amazing miracle has been done. And it's quite apparent to all of those in Jerusalem. We can't deny the fact that the miracle has been done. Apparently they didn't believe it. But at least they can't deny it. I'd suggest to you that it is impossible in the light of known evidence for the unbelieving mind to deny the resurrection of Christ. Doesn't mean they believe it. Here is evidence they can't possibly deny, but they shrug it off. They shrug it off. You know, humans seem to always want to have the power and the authority in the, on their side. <coughs> I want you folks to, to think about the fact that here we are looking at the breaking point in Scripture where that the Sadducees had a high priest and any preaching of this Jesus raising from the dead was not going to fly, okay? It'd be devastating to their position. You know, if they had simply believed Peter and said, well, now hold on a minute. I mean, you know, maybe Peter's right. I wouldn't be preaching this to you right now. So these, these temple authorities, the Sadducees, basically said, nope, we cannot let this go any further up the chain of command. All right? So let's just tell them not to speak anymore in the name of Jesus. Gee, seems like a simple solution, right? So they did called them in, commanded them not to speak, nor teach in the name of Jesus. Now let me point out to you a couple of facts here. That they didn't have the authority to do that. Here is a verse of Scripture that is so often quoted. You know, Peter says, Is it right in the sight of God to obey you or God? Should we obey man or God? And many a Christian has argued for his disobedience based on that verse. I want to simply point out to you folks that what they are commanding these men, they don't have the right to, to, to command. They just don't have the right. They are not under Rome's provision. They are not the civil authority. That was obvious, okay, in the trial and the death of Christ. You know, we can't do this. We can't put this, this Jesus to death. We can't 
try the man for his life. There are certain things we can do, but, but that we can't do. And one of the things we can't do is stop free speech. Not under Roman law, the Jews had certain ceremonial and religious laws which they were allowed to practice under Rome's dominion as a unique nation. Incidentally, all other conquered nations had to go into to polytheism, but not Israel. No, they were allowed to continue the worship of their one true God. You know, the Roman leaders felt that if you were polytheistic, well, then there wouldn't be any, you're no, you're no real threat. There wouldn't be any power greater than the government uh, to overthrow you. But if you were monotheistic, you were likely to put your God above the government and that they, they, that they just would not allow that. However, they made one exception in the case of Israel. So there were certain religious laws that they could enforce in the area of sacrifice. You could, you could, go, you could go and argue. I, I suppose you could go argue uh, to the Roman authorities that, you know, well, this high priest over here, he wouldn't accept um, your, your you, you could argue he wouldn't accept your little sacrifice, your little sheep, because he was unclean, so they wouldn't accept him uh, for sacrifice. You could run to the Roman Supreme Court and you could say, hey, I want to sue that guy. They wouldn't accept my sacrifice. You wouldn't get anywhere. They were allowed to exercise those laws. They were not allowed to throttle free speech. Free speech is not, it is not a, a, a tenant just of the United States, but it was a liberty of Roman citizens and those under Roman control. So what Peter is saying here is not only that he has to obey God, but they have no authority to pass the law that they pass. Now, I shouldn't, uh, I shouldn't leave the subject without pointing out to you that I believe that the Scriptures teach submission to authority, not unquestioned obedience. I believe that we should submit to the United States government. If, or whatever government you're from or whatever. Uh, if, if they say, if the government says no more prayer, no more Bible reading, we submit to the United States government. That is not that we give up prayer and Bible reading because they don't have the authority from God vested in them to pass such laws. However, if they do pass such laws, we would submit to them. We would continue to read our Bible. We would continue to pray. We would continue to be shot or thrown in the lion's den, whatever, right? You know, whatever they do today. Just as Daniel was, or whatever the penalty is. I occasionally, very, very seldom, but occasionally exceed the speed limit, uh, in which event I do submit to the law. It isn't that I try to overthrow it or destroy it. I pay the fine. I'll go in the courthouse whistling and I'll pay the fine. I do, I do try to submit to or obey that law. However, I submit to it. Uh, I submit to it without question. And I pay the penalty, the penalty whatever that is. I believe this, the Scriptures teach submission. We are not to organize, overthrow the government. We are not a political power, folks, okay? We are a voice for Christ. We are to be controlled by the Holy Spirit. We're still looking at that control. They were commanded not to speak in the name of Jesus. And once again, we see Jesus, verse 18, not the Lord Jesus Christ. For the rulers would not in any way give any ground on Jesus of Nazareth being the Jehovah of the Old Testament. Well, since they said that in verse 20, they were further threatened. Now, I don't know what those threatenings pertain to or involved. I, I would suggest to you the word is a strong word. And these men 
uh, did have a measure of authority in Israel. I have no idea what the disciples went through. And after they had threatened them quite severely, according to the Greek word there, they couldn't find anything anywhere in which they could punish them, so they let them go. You know, if they if they'd done something, the people would have rioted, I suppose. Now it says, all glorified God for that which was done. I, I can't pass that verse by without at least mentioning to you that I have had many a person point his finger at my nose and say, Steve, when the Bible says all, it means all. Fantastic. I assume then that that means that the high priests, the Sadducees, the priests, the captain of the temple, all the guards, everybody glorified God you know, for that which was done. And I don't believe that, folks, any more than you do. I think it means all of the people who witnessed that miracle, not everybody in Rome, not everybody in Oklahoma City glorified God for that which was done at this particular time. In fact, uh, uh, in the very locality, you know, I don't believe it includes the rulers who had just finished threatening Peter and John. And it's just one simple illustration of how the Holy Spirit uses the language. You know, we, we also use all that way in our own English language. When we use the word all, we, we limit it by context. You know, we, we ate all the turkey, okay, at, on Thanksgiving. It, well, that surely doesn't mean that everybody in the world ate all that turkey. Uh, it's limited by locale. The man was above 40, it says, 40 years old. This is the first time that we're told that he was 40 years, at least 40 years. We know that he was lame from birth. Now we find out he was over 40 when he was healed. We'll stop right here uh, at the uh, beginning of the paragraph at uh, verse 23, uh, and Lord willing, we'll pick up there next week. I love you all. I truly do. Rest in Him. Until next time, this is Steve. Thanks for watching.